Um, so good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you are, and uh, welcome to the stream, or welcome to this video if you're watching the um, recording on YouTube or on Twitch. So, as announced, and you know, I'm gonna work tonight on continuing the memory cache implementation for the ICE forty. Um, let me start uh, by a few updates of what happened since um, last since the last stream. Uh, let me just uh, check my notes quickly. Okay, so. The first thing I want to talk about is the uh, ICE 40 SP RAM, the single port RAM. If you um, remember last time I mentioned that it didn't have a read enable um, input. And a read enable input, uh, I wanted to use uh, I wanted to use one to Know, do pipeline read and, and be able to store the pipeline, the whole thing I explained with the adder and the, and the clock enable and all that, all that thing. That only works if you have a read enable on the RAM, on the SP RAM and the SP RAM doesn't have one. What it has is a chip select, uh, but it wasn't clear from the documentation if you could use the chip select as a read enable or not. Like, you know, what happens to the output data when um, the chip select uh, of the SP RAM falls? So, what I did is first check the simulation model from uh, Yosis, um, and that wasn't um, especially great news because, uh, according to that simulation model, um, if you drop the clock enable, the chip enable, on the next cycle, the read data becomes invalid, which um, is definitely not uh, what I want. So. Um, you know, I figured, okay, well, that's the model from Yosis. Um, I then decided to check the simulation model from the vendor it, uh, itself, so the simulation mon uh, the simulation model uh, from uh, Radiant. In this case, I didn't I didn't try the one from Ice Cube, but I, I used the one from Radiant, and that's what that uh, was much better because according at least to that simulation model, um, the data stayed valid and stayed. Uh, the same as the previous cycle, which means I could use the chip select as a read enable. But now I have a problem. I have two simulation models that don't agree with each other, and the simula and the documentation doesn't say anything. Like it, it doesn't specify one behavior or the other. So what I ended up doing is actually just testing it in hardware. Um, I wrote a test, you know, that fills the SPRAM with some random data, and then. Um, this pipeline read um, and toggles the the chip enable randomly according to a um, random number generator and looks at the output if it stays the same when the uh, when it's slow or not if it stays valid and um, what I basically did is I used uh, I put a, a SP RAM and then in parallel I put uh, embedded block RAM which has a read enable which works and I submit them the same inputs. And I compare the read data to make sure they match, uh, like continuously. And I let that run, and that didn't report any error, um, which means I'm confident that the I can use it as a read enable. Um, and um, as such, I um, let me switch. If we go to Yosis. Uh, Okay, yeah. So I opened the pull request with a patch that actually fixes the simulation model for the SPRAM to actually reflect what the hardware is doing. And um, I. Wait, that's something. What? 20. I thought. I... Yeah, I'm just a little surprised because I thought I did that today, like this morning. Apparently, I did that last night. Oh damn it! I'm I'm becoming crazy. Um, 
Okay, no, whatever. Uh, but anyway, it's it uh, it just got merged, so the David uh, Devsha um, merged it, you know, like an hour ago or something. So yeah, if you update your users, now you'll have a simulation model that actually reflect what really happens for the SPRAM. So that was the first note about the SPRAM, how it behaves, because that's. That's kind of a behavior that's critical for this implementation of a cache is if it doesn't behave uh, um, or I expect it to, then we've screwed up the entire design. So there we go. I mean, there, there was a way to fix, to fix that. Right? I explained it yeah, last stream, but uh, at least I don't have to uh, waste logic on, on working around that. So that was the first thing. Um, as I mentioned um, in the last stream, I also implemented um, let me check if I have. Did I copy the file? No, I have not. Wait, give me a second. I need to copy some file from my laptop to the streaming machine. Um, So I wrote this, which is um, mem a memory simulator. So basically, it has a it simulates a memory controller and a, an actual memory, um, but it's just it's just for simulation, right? Basically, uh, there is really nothing uh, interesting or that that interesting in in here. It just accept uh, reads, writes, and and it's not even. Um, I mean, yeah, no, not really. You can't really synthesize it because it, it relies on having like 16 megabyte of block RAM, which no FPGA would have. So um, it's purely for simulation. So I can plug that to the uh, cache and uh, and I don't have to simulate uh, like a SPIS RAM or, or an Hyper RAM or whatever. I, I can just connect this fake memory controller that will actually, you know, it executes the read, it executes the write. And if you actually you know, read data that you previously uh, wrote, it will actually return the right value and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's one of the things I wrote. I also wrote a test bench for the memory core controller. So that basically instantiates the memory controller core, then connects it to the simulated memory that I uh, just just wrote that I described just before, and then I have a couple of uh, um, like very 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 log tasks, so that kind of function call basically, so I can execute read and I can execute uh, write request, and then here I have a bunch of uh, manual operation where I just tell him to read at that address, tell him to write at this address, and stuff like that. Uh, obviously, this is a very very basic. Um, test bench. Uh, you would need to write a, a much more complex one, um, you know, to be confident that your core doesn't have any errors or stuff like that. But I usually start with a simple one like this, with where I just issue special commands because, um, well, first, I mean, if the basic doesn't work, like a complex one doesn't have a chance of working right and it's easier to debug if you only have one request or, or like 10 requests than if you start sending you know hundreds or thousands of requests randomly um, and so I start with a very simple test bench um, and I uh, and then you know make it more complex uh, as time goes goes on and um, also by sending manual request I can also make sure that I test some cases that I know will be problematic uh, and we'll, we'll come to that later I'll explain a, a few things um, I thought about um, so I did actually run that test bench against the, uh, the implementation we uh, wrote last time and uh, and fixed a couple of things so I'll, I'll actually show a diff right now and uh, and explain exactly the couple of things I had to change. So I saved the previous version here. 
And that's the current version. Okay. Of course. Okay. Um, so, I mean, there, there is some, uh, like, you know, that's just a white space fix, so that sort of doesn't matter. Here, I just changed some wire to reg, uh, just because I changed the way I switched to a process instead of combinatorial. That's not really important, so I'm just going to skip that. These are white space fix. Okay, so <clears throat> here is an important, uh, let me switch to where it actually explained. Uh, okay, here. That's actually an important uh, thing I missed um, the last time, is when we select a given cache line to evict, um, we actually need to save, you know, for which, which tag it contained, if it was valid, and, uh, and which way we actually uh, decided to evict, because when we switch to memory mode, um, those value were combinatorial outputs from um, the previous request and they become invalid the, the next cycle, which means that when we switch to memory mode to actually read and write cache line, by that time those values became invalid. Um, and so what I did is I, I captured them while I'm in bus mode and then when I switch to memory mode, I just use uh, these values. So for instance, um, here when I uh, access um, you know, give the address to the memory interface to flush a dirty line. Um, I give. I need to give the saved value, which I denoted with a underscore r for like registered. Um, same thing. Um, same thing here, basically, um, where we need to save which way we actually decided to replace. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other important thing is this. Um, <clears throat> so I want to send a feedback to the outside if the request that they submitted uh, was successful or not. So that's what I called ACK and NAC. Um, and although it, it's correct that an ACK knowledge only happens if it was a lookup hit, um, and you do when when it's a miss, it's in that it's indeed uh, um, uh, not acknowledged, which means that the request wasn't served. the The outside world is perfectly free to send requests uh, while we're busy in memory mode, um, either loading or flushing a dirty cache line. Which means if we re if we receive a valid request and we're not in bus mode. We actually need to knock the request to tell the outside that okay, yeah, that request was not processed because we're busy. Um, it doesn't really matter if we're busy uh, loading data or whatever, or if it was a cache miss. Um, the outside doesn't need to know that. All it needs to know is that the request wasn't processed, so that it can submit it again later. Um, the rest of the changes is pretty much uh, what I described. I mean, uh, I changed the location of some of the um, <coughs> some of the assignment um, that I rewrote as combinatorial process instead. Uh, that's what I was talking about last time. Um, that I didn't wire wire uh, completely. Um, what is Yeah, yeah, that's basically the logic I described but didn't write down last time. Um, I just talked about it and it, here it's just formalized in, in Verilog. Um, here is a change about that I'm going to discuss later about, um, you know, some some issue that I, I, uh, I found out um, could potentially happen and, and the way to deal with them. So, um, let me take... Go back to this. Hey, hi, Matthew, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it's already merged. <laughs> I should pay attention to the chat, sorry. Um, <clears throat> oh, wait a second. Why?
Uh, wait a second, because the capture of the remarkable isn't working. <clears throat> I need to fix that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Sorry, small technical issue. <clears throat> So I wanted to talk about a few scenarios that can fail. Um, so the way the memory controller is currently written is it accepts a request at every cycle, right? And and we we talked about how we're gonna make a bus adapter that trans basically translate wishbone into that and just sending requests. But ideally, we'd still like the core itself to uh, be able to accept requests, you know, as a pure pipeline, basically. That means we can have requests one after the other directly, um, you know, one cycle and directly the other and stuff, and stuff like that. And that, um, as I mentioned you know, in I think it was the, already the first stream. Is that something that can happen? Is you have two consecutive requests for the same cache line. Now, if it's two read for the same cache line, it's not going to be too much of an issue. Uh, but there are some scenarios. Uh, we discussed already some scenario that could potentially fail or have issues and stuff like that. But I I came up with uh, more ways in which it can fail, um, and that we will need to deal with in some way. Um, so, the first is the way I see the bus adapter working um, is the outside bus wants to access um, particular data. It sends a request at some time. You know, you have the request. And then sometime later, like well, actually just the next cycle, the controller sends a NAC. And basically it just retries the same request um, over and over, you know. And at some point, the controller will have loaded the line, the, the cache line, I mean, and will respond with a hack. And at that point, the... Uh, the the bus can move on to the next request. Okay, so that how it would happen for Wishbone, and that's fairly straightforward. Um, but something I'd like to be able be able to do is, if you look at the vex, there's actually two. Um, Sorry, there's actually two wishbone bus. Um, and so the way I saw that working is basically the controller sends a request on uh, from, from bus A and then do, and gets told NAC, for instance, and then sends a request from uh, bus B and gets told NAC or, or ACK, it doesn't matter, but basically interlays the access, like one cycle after the other inside the pipeline, okay? Um, and so, essentially, you would have uh, multiple wishbone bus, multiple possible master that could be like the in the vex that could be like the instruction and the data uh, access pipe. If you use PyCoreV, it could be like in the Akade badge, you have multiple PyCoreV running in parallel. It's a multi core design. You could have multiple PyCoreV trying to access the same um, data, that kind of stuff. And it just cycles in the loop and tries to serve the request one after the other, okay? Um, and this sends it to the memory controller. Now, they could be a very unlucky, I mean, it would be very unlucky, but it's theoretically possible that, um, imagine you have a two-way cache, or, or even just a one-way cache if you wanted to, um, and you have like four different access bus, and they all try to hit the same memory address, or not not even the same memory address, like memory addresses that end up on the same cache line. What could it, what could possibly happen is that um, the request path A 
sends, uh, sends a request, it's a miss that triggers a uh, cache line load. Right? Other buses submit other requests, whatever. Um, and then before request A is actually resubmitted, re um, another request from another of the multiplex bus comes in and tries to hit the same cache line. And so here we have request B that hits the same cache line. And if we're in a one-way cache, we only have one cache line, which means that um, this will be a miss. And we're going to load... the address for request B instead of, uh, and, and at that point we actually never answered request A ever. I mean, request A is continuously resubmitted, but it's never served. Um, and if if we load the, the, the cache line for request B, and then, you know, unlucky, uh, request A is resubmitted before request B is actually served, um, well, we're going to again evict that slash cache line and load A again. Yeah, I mean, and you see what can happen is that it would be extremely unlucky, I, you know, grant you, uh, but you could actually get into um, uh, kind of a cycle where you're basically continuously flushing and loading new cache line and never actually serve any request. Um, which is definitely uh, bad, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, that's, in the way I explained it, that can only happen if you have a one-way cache or, uh, or if you have or rather, if you have um, less ways in your cache than master buses, okay. In our case, since because we have a four-way cache and we never have more than two bus master bus, that actually can't happen. That scenario can't happen. However, because of a previous decision I made, is that I'm only updating the age of the cache line, not when we actually load from it, but I mean not when I not when we load it from memory, but rather on the first subsequent access that actually hits that line. Uh, well, in the scenario that I described, it's basically if you only only had one way because. Every load of that cache line, because the load at selecting which way we, we evict is only based on the age or on the valid status, but if they're all valid, it's only we always evict the uh, oldest way. Um, and during all that time, we don't actually serve any requests, which means there is never any cache hits which means the age never get updated, which means we always evict the same cache line. And so we can actually get into that scenario, even in a four-way cache, even with only two um, master buses submitting requests, just because of the decision that we only update the age when we um, actually have a successful access and not when actually loading the line from memory. Okay, uh, was that understandable? Like, uh, did anybody actually understand what I meant? Because it seemed a little um, confusing. Uh, I'm not sure um, if I made myself clear. <laughs> because I mean, obviously it's a contrived scenario, so it's kind of hard to explain. All failure scenario are always kind of uh, you know, weird edge cases. Um, got it? Okay, well then. That's good. That, uh, that's, uh, that means I was more clear than I thought I was. <laughs> anyway, um, so 
how to deal with that um, I'm honestly not entirely sure yet there are several options well first the, the thing to realize is that if we go for the single master like we don't we don't actually interlace requests or, or, or uh, have multiple masters or stuff like that so we like the standard simple wishbone adapter there is only ever one request pending and we never move on to the next request before we actually serve that one which means that whole scenario just can't happen which means like for the first tests and stuff like that we could actually just say okay we know this issue is there we know if we move to more complex buses we might have to deal with it but at this very moment, we could connect it to a system and it, have it work perfectly because um, our bus adapter will not, um, will not trigger that. And I th for the time being, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I did implement an alternative, and it's basically to update the, um, the age on the load. And that's what I uh, implemented here. Uh, if we look at the diff... here so that's the old logic uh, for updating the age and that logic is, is valid um, if we are in bus mode so we're, we're serving access from the bus that's the old logic of updating the age and if we're not in bus mode then um, that means we're executing a load and at that point I added like a different age logic um, which is basically if uh, we set the age to zero on the way we are operating on because that's uh, the way we're loading so it's the most recent data um, again there is like a guard if the if the way is not valid we set it to the default value of a number of way, the maximum age basically if the way is not valid that's the same as this it doesn't change and for all the other way, we um, we increment them if the way we're evicting was actually valid. Um, and so, if if we're evicting a, a way that's not valid, that wait a second. I'm just thinking because I think I just made him I um just re explaining the logic. Um I I'm not sure it's actually correct. Um why wouldn't we increment it if it was invalid? I Ah, yes, um, okay. I remember now. Um, that's just a sort of a small optimization. Um, okay. Basically, we want to implement kind of the same logic as, as this, uh, right? Except we know that the way we replaced, the way that we evicted, Uh, you don't see the whole width of the very log. I mean the okay, like the the command here is slightly cut, but for the rest you see all of it. I mean I can move to the to this view, but there is. I mean the only thing, the only part that you didn't see is this, but the rest is. Um, the rest is complete. I don't quite see the whole width of the very log. Second to last line. Oh, was that cut? Uh, let me check. Oh yeah, you're right. I didn't even notice that it 
Why is that cut? Oh yeah, yeah, never mind. Um, okay, you're right. It was it was cut. Sorry, I didn't see. Um, I didn't see that. Uh, th that was cut indeed, and that's the part I'm talking about. So yeah, that makes sense. Sorry. Um, so when we update the, um, imagine we load. So we load a new line. Okay. There is two possibilities. Either we load it in um, a line that was already valid, and if it was already valid, its age must have been three, because that's where we load we load we load it in the oldest way. Um, Is that true? Yes. We load it in the oldest way. Uh. Oh man, this... I knew that this uh, read after... The, the, this this delay in uh, in loading the data um, was gonna be an issue, like from the start. Um, and I thought I could ignore most of it, but it's always coming back to bite me. Um, because I'm not actually sure that I'm writing. It doesn't matter. Yes, no, never mind. It doesn't matter. Um, I was wondering if the... Because, again, like, the the value that we read here is possibly... In, um, is old. Like, every value we read uh, from way underscore something is one cycle late, which means could pos potentially be invalid. Uh, but here it doesn't matter because we will overwrite all of them. So, uh, they're fine. Okay. Um, what I meant to say is that if the way that we uh, are loading uh, was previously valid, its age must have been uh, 3. We're now setting it to 0, which means that uh, all the other one must move by 1, because we're basically executing the same condition as here, except this is 3, which is the maximum value, which means this is true all the time, which means we always increment by 1. Now, if that way was not valid, I don't. I still don't know. Like, why? Why did I say that? Um, it would because e even if that way was not valid, or some other could have been valid, um, and as such. The age must be incremented. We can't possibly replace the way. Yeah. Not sure why I did that. That's wrong. I mean, as far as I can tell. Um. That should just be press one, basically. Um, because, I mean, if I go back to this, imagine that we have, um, let's say that, okay, I have valid and then uh, age. Okay, and let's say that we have way zero, one, two, and three. So let's say that I have a uh, valid one, age zero, Valid one H one and then not valid H three not valid H three. Uh, I'm gonna pick this way is the one that's gonna get picked for eviction. And the next value that I want to write for the age is zero three because it's still invalid. 
it becomes valid and its age is zero and the age of all the other is incremented. Which mean uh, it's just plus one here. It's always increment by one. I don't know why I uh, I used ev valid r. Anyway, so yeah, obviously just found a bug um, in the age update. Um, so that's that's one way of fixing uh, this kind of uh, this conflict scenario. Um, and like a impossible loop. Um, at the moment, the way I implemented it, it cost me a little more logic uh, than I'd like. It it costs like thirty lots. Like if I switch between uh, enabling it or not enabling it, uh, it costs like thirty lots. Uh, on it goes from two hundred to two hundred and thirty. So it's like more than ten percent increase of size just to deal with that. Uh, for something that you know remind you, if you connect it to a wishbone bus, it's not going to happen ever, right? So, although I, I like things to be correct, uh, an increase of 10% of the size of the core to deal with a case that can't happen, uh, I'm not too hot about that. So, um, that's why I'm not sure if I will implement it or not. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably defer that to after I've implemented the actual bus adapters. Um, and see if I can deal with the case in there somehow uh, and just prevent those those cases from happening. Um, another screwed up case that can potentially happen, so let me just erase this. It's again with that entire um, pipelining delay thing is imagine you have a write that hits a given cache line and that turns that at that point it becomes dirty because well, the cache now contains data that's not in memory, which means we're going to need to flush it. On the absolute, um, the right, right after that, next cycle, we have a read for an address that it's the same cache line, but a different address uh, in memory. So the, the tag, uh, it's, a, it's a different tag, um, which means it's a... Uh, um, it's a cache miss, right? Now, at that point, the age here has not been updated and, and read here, which means the eviction decision that we take here will uh, will potentially be to evict um, the cache line we just wrote to here. Um, only problem is the value we latched here as dirty equals zero because we because of the delay in in updating the the tagram at this point we didn't know we were dirty which means that we will go to the uh, memory load without ever flushing the cache line and we just thought the write has been lost we just corrupted data so um, obviously that's not good. Um, corrupting data, that's not something we can accept. And again, that can only happen if we have consecutive requests to the same, that hit the same cache line. Um, I haven't evaluated the logic, the, the logic cost to deal with that. Um, the easiest would probably be to um, To detect those cases, I mean, essentially we have um, the tagram here.
here we can save the index and we can also do a comparator here or just to that compare that with the previous index and here we would have a signal that basically tell us danger conflict like we have a conflict um, we have two um, requests to two consecutive um, requests that hit the same cache line which mean we're fetching invalid data from uh, the tagram and you can't exactly trust it um, and we could use that to um, always do a flush for instance like even we don't know if it's dirty or not we flushing like if it's dirty well we did what was good um, and actually we can even do more is we can register uh, and double register the right signal so that we know if the previous was a right or not and so we can say okay if we have a conflict which is you know already kind of unlikely and it was a right then we always do a flush we might do an unnecessary flush that impacts the efficiency of the cache but at least that guarantees correctness that would be like a rel reliably um, lightweight way of implementing uh, like a um, to deal with that issue basically um, again because this can't possibly happen in uh, the wishbone case and stuff like that I would probably differ implementing that um, to later because because I don't want to pay the logic for it for something that can't happen um, I will only have to deal with it if I can actually have consecutive requests that can hit the same cache line <laughs> Now, like um, all of these are kind of like kind of um, uh, ad hoc way of dealing with the issue, right? Um, we could perfectly take um, uh, another approach and deal with all of these issues at once. And do something like this. That's basically a conflict bypass. You, you, you will find that like in, in a C pipeline CPU implementation when you're trying to do um, consecutive in instruction there where the next instruction use the result of the previous one. You, you have that kind of uh, um, conflict um, where you're trying to read a value that's not yet updated in the RAM. And on some FPGA you can use the uh, write first policy um, that policy does not work here now that the, the policy is sorry I'm, I, I went slowly here but I know that policy doesn't work here because the the, ta the tagram doesn't support read and write at the same um, On the same cycle, right? Um, but I was thinking of something else. So one possibility to deal with those kind of conflicts is that in addition, so this is the right, the right port of the RAM. And so here you have your logic. And instead of just sending your update writes to the uh, to the RAM write port, you also send them to register. And then instead of directly taking the side of the the read side of the RAM, you basically implement a mux. And if you detect a conflict, you basically bypass the memory and directly take it from the register so that you have the most up-to-date value. That would solve all of these issues like at once at the cost of 
Well, that's the problem, right? Um, is that that's four times 16 bits. So that's um, 64 bit wide bus. So this max is gonna cost 64 lots. This register, because it can't be merged with uh, the logic, is gonna cost 64 LCs as well. This is gonna cost eight lots. And the comparator is gonna cost uh, nothing like three. Which means the cost of implementing that solution is one layer of logic and 128, 136, like about 140 lots. Currently, the entire controller is like 250 lots. So I'm not really too hot about paying 140 lots just to deal with the problem that, as I said, will not happen when you, uh, when we're interfacing with Wishboard, right? So yeah, that's kind of that's kind of why I'm trying to find ways around it. Is because currently, like the proper way, uh, if you wish, like the absolute universal way of dealing with the problem, is very costly, um, lot wise. Now, something else I could try actually. But I think about it, uh, but I can't try it now. As as I said, the the block RAM doesn't have um, doesn't have a write mode first, okay, um, and actually doesn't even support reading and writing at the same address. So uh, the way I worked around that in the previous stream, which I uh, explained um, in detail was to basically instead of having um, so let's let's imagine that this is the embedded block RAM right side so we have the clock and we have the data okay um, and the address what I did is I replaced that with this uh, wait no give me a second I replaced this with, I inverted the clock, or rather I used the uh, primitive that operates on the negative edge of the clock. And then here I'm registering, the data and address and feed them like this. That's my way of dealing with the um, the fact that the, the embedded block RAM cannot operate on the same clock edge if you're accessing the same address. Um, now, if you imagine that I do this instead, I use the inverter. But I don't I don't put the register put the register here. So what's gonna happen is my writes are gonna be executed kind of at the midpoint between two clock cycles, which means that on, on the next read, they will actually be available. They will be there, they will be updated, which means I don't have that delay. The problem of course is that suddenly the time I have to compute the data and address well it, it's just been halved like li literally I, I I need my logic to instead of executing in like 33 nanoseconds well no I have 16 nanoseconds to generate those signals and I'm not sure that's gonna be timing um, but that's something that I could try but I can't, I can't try it right now because the only way I'm gonna get realistic fmax um, from next PNR is, you know, integrated in a system, right? Um, but that's an option. Like if if that if that works and that meets timing, that would be one way of dealing with the problem, and that solves all the access conflicts, um, basically. So I, 
yeah so yeah something to keep in mind um, basically um, okay that's the thing I wanted to um, explain about the design and, and the kind of conflicts um, we have to deal with <clears throat> now there are other modifications that I want to make um, and I knew I, I knew I would need those kind of since the beginning um, I didn't take them into account so far because I didn't want them to drive the design too much um, because like if it's absolutely impossible to implement them I can live without them uh, but I would rather have them if possible and Basically, it's the ability. It's like special command to send to the cache. Currently, the cache kind of works on its own, right? But there are two things that I would like to be able to do. The first is to forcibly invalidate all cache line, so that it, it just forgets that it has data in the cache, um, drops it if it has, no matter like whatever. Uh, this would pretty much be only used at boot um, because although the embedded block RAMs that contain all the information about the cache line and stuff like that they are initialized to zero when you boot the FPGA, right? However, imagine that I want to reboot the, um, the processor like a um, like a runtime run reset. Um, unfortunately, those block RAMs, they don't have a reset line. Like, I can't assert a signal and magically convert their entire, uh, their entire content to zero. That just doesn't work like that. That doesn't exist um, for in any FPGA that I know of. Which means I pretty much have to consider the content of the block RAM to be undefined at boot. Which means I could have some valid cache line that contained data from the previous time the FPGA was booted. And that's Probably not something I'd like, um, and so I'd like a way to basically forcibly invalidate the um, um, the cache. The way I see that is um, basically using two additional address bits. Um, is you have your actual memory address, which in our case is. 26 bits, if I remember correctly, something like that, and then I would have uh, the two MSB, would be used for the access mode, and then we would have something like zero zero is normal access. And then we would have one one be uh, invalidate, and so this whatever cache line correspond to that particular memory address, this would pretty much um, clears it. At the, at the very least, it needs to write valid equals zero to all the ways to make sure that whatever data is in it is is dropped. What once valid is equal to zero. Um, nothing matter about the other like the tag value doesn't matter it's not considered the age doesn't matter it's gonna get overridden and the dirty flag doesn't val doesn't matter because the dirty flag is only interpreted um, when valid is one so yeah doesn't matter is that true is the dirty flag only in, in uh, interpreted when let me recheck that. What do we is dirty? If the evicted is dirty, and EV dirty is directly the bit from there.
And so the answer is no, we actually need to write dirty equals zero as well. I mean, either that or we just uh, get this with um, EV valid as well. Just, um, but currently we assume that if dirty equal one, that means that the way was valid, um, which where previously we could assume because the, the controller maintains that particular you know assumption. But if we go with an invalidate that writes valid equals zero, we need to write dirty equals zero at the same time. Um, either that or just change this condition to be EV dirty and EV valid, something like that. Um, but yeah, um, something to keep in mind. Uh, so that's the first command that I'd like to be able to submit to the cache. And the other command would be... Uh, oh, damn it, I forgot to switch to... Uh, I was checking the code to see where we use uh, the dirty signal, the EV dirty. It's only used uh, here when we decide that we have a cache miss, if we need to flush it or uh, just read the new one. And it's directly the dirty flag, like we don't check if, it's, it, if it was valid or not, um, which means that it, if it wasn't valid, um, we assume dirty was zero, right? Um, and the all the logic currently as, uh, guarantees that, but if we go with an invalidate command, that's no longer true. Um, so we need to write the dirty flag as well. That's what I was explaining in, in the code. The other command I'd like to be able to send is flush. Why? Uh, what, what would it do is basically, um, if a particular address in memory is dirty, or at least the cache line that corresponds to that particular address's memory is dirty, it would write it back to memory. Now, that's super useful when you have DMA in your system, because most of the time you would have um, the DMA wouldn't go through the cache, right? I think I, 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 drew, a, I drew a diagram of this. Um, in the in the first stream, but you would have your memory controller. Here you would have an arbiter, and then here you would have your cache. And your CPU is accessing the memory through the cache, but the DMA engine uh, would most likely not be accessing it through the cache. It would talk directly to the con to the memory controller because the DMA issues burst access directly. It doesn't need a, a cache, and you don't want to uh, basically trash the cache um, with DMA access, like, for instance, to feed your HDMI core or, or something like that, or your sound core or whatever, right? But that means that if you write, I'm going to take the HDMI example and the frame buffer example, but that's, that's valid for any kind of peripheral that exchange data. Uh, if your CPU um, either reads or writes data from memory, um, you need a flush command that's... Um, would basically... Actually, do we want? Oh, so we, at the very least, we, we need something that forces the cache to write back any dirty cache line to memory, because you update your frame buffer, some of those data might have stayed in the cache, like the image you just written is possibly still in the cache, and um, and it needs to hit the memory before it can be displayed, and so you need to force the cache somehow to take those cache lines that it has internally and write them to memory. That's the first thing. Now, you also have the other access, uh, because like imagine this was HDMI out, and you also have HDMI in. Um, the other way around is, is, way as, is uh, correct as well, in the sense that the HDMI in is going to write the captured image to the memory uh, directly. But if you're trying to read that image from the CPU, if some of the, that area is already loaded in the cache, the cache possibly has no idea that 
its content doesn't match the memory anymore, right? And so you need a way to force it to reload the um, the line from memory, basically forcing forcing um, a cache miss. Um, and so we could either have one command that does both, or possibly have a flush write uh, and a and a force read, something like that. Um, so that's the kind of command um, we need to add. Um, no, bef because those, as I mentioned, those are not um, essential. I mean, they're very useful, and and and, and it would be a uh, really annoying not to have them. Um, but I can test, and I can you know write a system, boot it, and 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 have a working system without them, basically. And so I will probably leave that for later on. And uh, something I want to um, design and write uh, right now is the wishbone bus adapter. Because once that's done, we can actually take the cache and actually connect it to a Pico V32 and actually run it, um, which would be nice. Um, so let's go and design that. So that's really fairly straightforward because so a quick reminder about the wishbone bus in general we have an address line we have a write data line we have a read data line. We have a cycle flag, and we have we have a um, write enable flag. I mean, uh, you can write by by by. Um, sorry, um, one byte at a time, and so it's actually four signal. But whatever for the purpose of this example, it doesn't matter. That's essentially the wishbone bus, and a wishbone transaction goes. We have. Um, address which is invalid and then suddenly it becomes valid oh sorry I for kind of forgot an important signal we have an acknowledge signal <laughs> um, and so when the address becomes valid at the same time we have the cycle that becomes valid which indicates that we are submitting a request. Um, let's imagine that it's a read request. So write enable would stay low. Write data is uh, essentially invalid. Doesn't matter. And read data is invalid except at some point we need to actually return the value and the acknowledge becomes one at the same cycle that we okay and the address becomes invalid here so that's that's a wishbone transfer right and and this This one is the cycle where the, the actual data transfer occurs is because cycle is one, acknowledge is one, and so that's the cycle where the read data needs to be correct. So how are we going to connect this to um, our request bus? So I'm going to pull up... the request bus so this is the bus we have essentially at the, the memory controller kind of um, native bus so 
sorry, uh, checking something. Um, so we need to provide the address, and then if and we need to provide it one cycle early, and then we need to provide you know what kind of request it is, the right data, the right mask, and if it's a valid request, stuff like that. So that's actually pretty easy, right? Because, well, the address we have stays stable directly. So let's actually write, um, let me pull the, this, okay. Um, Yeah, let's go to a new page. Um, the address is pretty much just gonna go directly to the request address. Next thing we need is, uh, we need write data and write masks. Now, these are technically one cycle later than address, but if we look at the wishbone bus, uh, okay, I, I drew, uh, let me draw a write transaction, what it looks like. So for write transaction, the read data stays invalid all the time, we it, so don't care. The write enable signal will rise at the same time as the cycle signal and fall at the same time. Well, actually, it's, it's not rise and fall, it's just undefined here. And the write data is undefined and it becomes valid at the same time as the address and it stays valid and and stable during the entire access. So that's a write cycle. So that's right and read. So what's important to note is that the write data, the address, the uh, write stroke, everything is stable the, uh, during the entire access, which means until we actually send the ACK, nothing moves on the bus. So the other signal we need is um, if it's a write, if it's a, um, the write data and the mask. And all of these signals, we can also just connect them directly. So if it's a write, it's going to be um, write enable. Then we have the right data, and we have right. Um, I don't remember the name in, in Wishbone. I think it's right strobe. It, it might be inverted logic. I think these are the right strobe are one if it's written and and um, and the opposite if it's not written, which is kind of the opposite of the mask. But that's pretty much a direct connection. Right, mask. Right data. So uh, so far the adapter is not actually adapting anything, right? <laughs> it's it's pretty much just a straight connection. Uh, let's go and continue with the other easy signal. <laughs> We, had, we see that the controller provides us an ACK and, um, 
and the read data signal. And the read, the read data signal is valid at the same time as the ACK is given, which is exactly what we need for wishbone. So, again, not very complicated. <laughs> RESP error data. Uh, wishbone hack again those are just direct connection <laughs> so that leaves us with exactly um, two signals that we haven't really dealt with we have the valid and we have the NAC and so how does that work in wishbone we have the the cycle signal That tells us that the request is valid. Um, and that signal will stay high until we actually acknowledge the request. And so it's more like a, a level thing, which means it stays at one until the request is pending, which is slightly different from our interface here, where valid doesn't indicate the, val the, the, re the current request is valid. It's every time valid is one, it's a new independent request, right? And so what we want to do is when we have a new request on the wishbone bus, we want to set this high for one cycle so that we send the request one time to the memory controller. And then if that request is acknowledged, we're done. We can we will move on to the next request. And if that request is not acknowledged and we get an actual knack, um, then we basically want to reissue the same request again to the memory controller until it actually succeeds. And at some point it should succeed. Um, because the only way its uh, request is uh, not acknowledged is the memory controller is busy flushing or loading a cache line, or it was a cache miss, which will trigger the load of the cache line so that the, at some point in the future, the same request will get reissued. Um, and so we just need a little bit of logic to uh, generate that. So how is that gonna work? If we go back to our diagrams here, let's say that we have the wishbone psych, we have the request valid, and we have um, the ACK, which is, and we have the NAC signal. Actually, let me um, space that a little better. This is going to become crowded. Oh, wait, I should probably speak uh, louder, but OK. Oh, good to know, Matthew. Yeah, I, I tried a new plugin, like a compressor, which is supposed to automatically adapt kind of the boost depending on um, um, how loud I'm talking. Um, glad to know that it seems to be working at least. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, so we have the cycle uh, of wishbone that starts. Let's assume that uh, every two, like this is a clock cycle, like I'm just, putting notches. I just don't want to draw a clock signal, that's just kind of annoying. Um, 
So that signal rises because we're processing a request. Now, what we want to happen is we can't directly send um, set request valid to one here at the same cycle because the address uh, needs to be one uh, cycle earlier, like it's named request address pre, pre here because it needs to be one cycle early. And in wishbone, it, it's not one cycle early, so well, we can't get it one cycle early. The only thing we can do is delay request valid, right? We don't, we don't know the future, we can just delay the other signal. So here we want to submit request valid, and we only want to set it once. And so we'll start with... Um, what happens if we get a knack? Which would happen here? Um, if we get a knack, we basically need to reissue the request and we can actually reissue it in the same cycle like we can just do this right it, it doesn't matter when this is the earliest that the NAC can come from and we can actually re, um, reissue it directly um, actually I'm gonna draw I'm gonna draw the, the NAC coming further just to just to illustrate the fact that request valid um, falls and stay at zero until we get either a hack or a NAC. And let's say that here we get a NAC. And so we reissue the request. And here let's say that we get a hack, which means we don't reissue the request. And the uh, the act signal is directly connected to the cycle signal, the act signal of the wishbone, which means here cycle will cycle will fall uh, or not. It will become it, it might stay high and just might indicate that there is a another transfer on the wishbone bus directly after this transfer. Like we don't know um, if it's gonna rise or not. And request valid here. Uh, needs to stay low and here it will basically possibly rise again depending on this value basically but here it needs to be low because at this point the address has not been valid yet okay so that's what we need um, to happen You don't want to block the bus so you can pipeline request. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Can you? I don't. Which which bus are you talking about? Like the wishbone or? Or the request input. Oh yeah, the the thing is I want the ACK and the NAC signal to basically correspond to the inputs the input um um request valid signal. Because I want this bus to be pipelined, right? 
I, I don't want this to be a, a shared burst or anything. I want this to literally be a pipeline where you submit request and a little later you get either ACK or NAC for that particular request. Because I want I want it to be pipeline because uh, if I want to implement like I have IDs to to uh, like optimize it for the VEX and stuff like that, and you would be able to basically send requests one after the other for address one two three four five six, uh, one after the other without waiting the response. The only thing you know is that a few cycles later you will either get an ACK or an ACK telling you if the data is valid or not. And so uh, that's why I want that bus to be pipeline. But of course, here at this particular moment, we're trying to connect it to the wishbone bus, which is not pipeline. And so we need we need to do the conversion. That's why I have a bus adapter, um, basically. Um, is that you know here in the diagram we have this request valid that correspond to this. And we have this that corresponds to this basically, right? They, they, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Like every request valid signal high is going to either have an ACK or an ACK. Um, and so the first thing we can notice uh, here is that every time we get an ACK, we basically res resubmit the request. So if we go to our logic diagram, Let's say that this is response NAC and request valid. That's pretty much the first thing we notice. And that makes sense because every time we get a knack, we know we can reissue it. For the request issue, the master has to keep track of the order request. Yes, it, it does. In case they need to be reissued, yes. Um, now, I want it. <laughs> the way it's going to work. So really in advance to what I was planning, but uh, um, um, the way I want to implement pipeline request is because the VEX has a level, a level one cache that it wants to load by burst. And so the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to submit the, requ the request for address zero uh, like in a kind of in a loop like for the wishbone case until it's... Um, Until it's until it's acknowledged, once it's acknowledged, well at that at that point I know I can load address one two three four five six and all the address of the cache line will be act, because it's in the same cache line it's loaded in memory and if I don't submit any other request in between, I know I can count on the cache actually acting those requests, um, and then I can submit them without really needed to keep track of them because I know they will work. That's kind of the way I plan to um, to implement it. Does that make sense? I mean, there is definitely a very tight coupling. Like the, the bus adapters, the way I see them, are um, a, an integral part of the memory cache, in the sense that there is a very tight coupling between the way the bus adapter operates and the, uh, the way the, the, the cache controller operates and the bus adapters, which means I have no problem on the, the bus adapters making assumptions about how the cache controller work because um, they're part of the same project, which means they have a uh, very intimate coupling on how they work. It's not the kind of thing I would expose uh, externally. Like In that interface, like the fact that the, the address here is provided one cycle early, that's like weird. That's that's not something I want the user to ever have to worry about. So that's not something I plan to expose to the kind of the world, if you want. Um, and that's why this is named MC Core. Uh, it's it's all it's always meant uh, as an internal interface, basically, right? 
So you would never, in a new project, you would always use one of the existing bus adapter, either Wishbone or Pico RV or, or, uh, or VEX. Um, and if you want to write your own bus adapter, then you need to dig into the internal of the, the memory controller and be aware of all the kind of awkwardness of that, of that particular interface, right? Um, it's not, yeah. Because, yeah, like when I design interface between modules, okay, either you keep to standard stuff like AXI, uh, um, Wishbone, AHB, uh, APB, whatever, uh, or when I design my own, like for instance this one, uh, I try to keep them like very logical so that all the signals, they belong to the same pipelining level, um, so that it's fairly straightforward or they work or, they use, or, or you're meant to use them and, and they don't have any weirdness or surprising behavior. Um, however, this request response interface um, for the cache itself between the, the core and the bus adapters, as far as I'm concerned, this is an internal interface, which means it's allowed to be weird. Um, it, it has surprising behavior, and, and, uh, and I can make assumption about the way it works um, um, to keep the logic as simple as possible, basically. Um, but that means that, you know, if you went from outside and tried to use that memory controller and you try to use that interface without knowing how the cache controller works internally, most likely you would get it wrong because you, you need uh, intimate knowledge of the internals of the cache controller to use that interface. I hope that uh, answered... Uh, your question? Okay, good. Um, so if we go back to this diagram, what I'm gonna have is one register that says pending. It basically tells me if a request is currently pending or not. And what I want is that signal to rise one cycle after the cycle is detected and to fall when we acknowledge the signal. So this would basically be Literally, uh, set and reset flip-flop with the set being the cycle signal and the reset being the acknowledged signal. And then here I have a AND gate with a inverter so that if If cycle is high and pending is low, then that also generates a request. And so here we have the case, okay, um, actually just checking that diagram, I got it wrong. There we go. If we're at the beginning of a cycle, which means that we have cycle and we don't have pending, then at the next cycle we raise it. We, we raise the signal. So this, here at this cycle, we have cycle uh, w, 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 the, the, okay. WB psych, the, the valid indicator of wishbone basically, and pending is equal to zero, which means at the next cycle we generate we're generating request valid. And at the next cycle, well, pending has risen, which means 
that's no longer true, which means it falls. And here the request is knocked, which means we reissue it until here, where pending goes down, which means here pending is down and cycle is potentially high. And at the next cycle, we potentially reissue the request. So that's the entirety of the adapter bus, which means the conversion from, you know, um, not not pipeline wishbone to like our pipeline interface is really just detecting when cycle rises and when we get a knack and um, combining the two so that's literally two lots that's the entirety of a wishbone <laughs> to uh resp to adapter so that's pretty straightforward um even if the the two bus might seem kind of different and they, they're very different in capacities and the way they work, but in the end, adapting from one to the other. Um, was still pretty straightforward. So let's just cut that quickly. Um, Let's name this MC bus wishbone. MC bus wishbone, is that what I said? Let me actually recheck the um, I want to recheck which which name I gave the signal in some other of my um actually I can check on the web. It's gonna be easiest. Uh, sorry. I want to uh, try to stay consistent between my uh, various projects, uh, so I'm just going to quickly check which name I gave all the wishbone signal. Um, Okay, so I named that right mask. Let's just do that. Ah, shit. Sorry. <laughs> um. So at the 
address at the right data. <clears throat> so I'm basically just uh, doing the I/O at the moment. Sorry, it's not necessarily the most uh, interesting thing to watch me type. Um, but if you have any question about the design or anything, you can uh, ask in the chat, and uh, um, I can do my best to answer while I'm doing the boring part of typing things. Or about anything really. Um, Okay, so that's our wishbone bus. Here we have an issue request. Recommend this. Um, right. Path. So right pass. We have which book? No uh, request. Write data. Which bone write data? Request write mass equal which bone write MSK. Yeah. Now what? I'm gonna name it write mass. That's more consistent and it has the same length as data. I don't remember if the wishbone right mask is the which polarity it has. Uh, which is kind of annoying. So that's something I have to check. That's always something I get confused because some of Sometimes when the mask is zero, that means that all the bytes are written, and when it's F, it means nothing is written, and sometimes it's the opposite. And if you look at the at the ICE forty, like the the mask implementation is actually different between the the SPRAM and the EB and the EBR and the embedded block RAM. Like for the SPRAM, um, mask equal one means that you write the bits, and zero means that you don't write it. And for the embedded block RAM, it's the opposite. Zero means you write it, and one means you don't write it. So consistency, right? Um, a read path would be assign which bone read data equal response read data.
think we're coming up good. Request padding. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, I think the... Uh, I don't know if they actually bought it from two different vendors. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's actually very possible because the, the embedded block RAM would have been designed and implemented at the time it was still silicon blue, right? But the Ultra Plus is a new product from Lattice, which means the SP RAM is a completely new block. Um, which might very, uh, yeah, probably actually comes from a completely different vendors, and so that's probably why it is. Um, so yeah, most likely. And not a response hack or Uh, so something I didn't specify, like in that diagram, in this diagram, um, the reset must win over the set. Like if both are won, the reset must win. Uh, I don't know if there is a symbol for that, um, but yeah. Which means here I need the reset to win, which means I need to code it the other way around. Um, Actually, need another region. Like new. Another register. Uh, I need a reset. No. Um, new is. That looks correct, right? We have our padding register, which is a set reset with the reset winning. Because it's in the other, which means that when there is an arc, it will always fall. And it rise again if cycle is one. We have our new, which is this signal here. which is if cycle is one and we currently don't have anything pending. The address is a direct connection. Request is valid either we've been knacked or it's a new request. The ACK is a direct connection. Write is write enable, write data, write mask, direct connection, read data, direct connection. Yeah, that looks good. So that was very easy. Um, so
so <laughs> we. What the hell? Um. So what would be the next step now? Um. Ideally, I'd want to. S I mean, I did simulate a lot. I can load the. Uh, actually, have a. Um, let me load this actually. Uh, okay, let me go to full screen. This. So that's the simple test bench. Um, that I wrote uh, where I issued uh, the, the commands manually. So it doesn't go through the wishbone bus because obviously I, I had not written the wishbone adapter yet. Um, but I did run some requests, right? Um, and I can see that they actually work. Uh, now, something I hope the I did uh, increase the font size for the for a signal. I hope they are large enough. The thing is, I to actually use the to actually use this, I need to see like a, a certain amount of signals. Like I can't put the the font too big, or it's it just becomes useless because I can't show enough signals at the same time. Um, but let's have a look at what's happening here. Um, I'm going to load the test bench. So the first thing I'm doing is basically issuing a request to a given address waiting a bit of time, and then issuing a read request to the same address. Which means that, that should succeed. I mean, this one should be knacked, and this one should, should succeed because I gave it some time to actually load the data. Uh, after that, I issue two writes to the same cache line, and then I try to read back one of the value. Um, like, by default, the entire memory is, is initialized where each word contains its address, which means that if I read from address 0x10, I read the word 0x10. Um, and so we can see here if we zoom on the requests. Okay. Let me zoom in. Here I have um, request valid is 1, the address address pre is set to 10 one cycle before and just after I get a knack telling me that um, that request couldn't be served I wait a little bit I submit the same request again here address 10 read and here I get a hack because now this entire all these requests are actually in the same cache line and so I basically get for ACA uh, consecutively and I get the read data here correct you know I read 10 and the next two ones are writes and then I've got a read again where I read back the value that I just wrote uh, wrote and I see that it's indeed 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 which is the value I wrote um, right so that's the the first few requests for the test bench that's basically this block um, then here, the only thing I'm doing, I'm actually doing the same thing, uh, but for different addresses that fall onto the same cache line. And here I have one way that slow dead, then two way, three way, four ways. Which means that when I do this one, suddenly I can't, I need to evict something, right? And the the one that's the oldest is this one, and it's dirty because I wrote some writes. 
which mean um, during the eviction I should see uh, cash flush and then a cash load. So let's see what happens. That was the first request. Second, for the first load, I mean the second uh, cash line load, third cash line load, fourth cash line load, and here we have the fifth. And just before, just before it, we have an access which is. Uh, Uh, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, we are, uh, sorry, we have uh, an access, um, that's the right, here we have the right burst, if you look at the right acknowledge signal. Um, Why do I do uh, at post edge and not just uh, at 200? Um, honestly, it's just more by habit because I'm not entirely sure that uh, my... I don't remember which, which value I used for the clock, <laughs> um, the clock interval. And I want to make sure that when I start a new command, I'm actually aligned to the, you know, the proper clock rhythm, basically. And so I just do an add pause edge just to make sure that um, I wait 200 milliseconds and then realign myself to whatever clock edge is the closest and then use that. Um, I think for here it doesn't matter because I think my clock rate is a multiple of... Uh, well, actually, no. Like, see, here my clock is 8 nanoseconds, right? Which means if I wait 200 nanoseconds, um, it's not necessarily a... It's not a multiple of 8, right? So yeah, that's the only reason. If uh, if here I put five, then then this would be fine. I could just do a uh, hash two hundred, I think. Um, but I want my command to start on the proper clock, on the, on on the clock edge, basically. That's yeah, the only reason. Um. Yeah, so here we see the right burst, and actually, if you, I don't, uh, yeah, that's the right burst, um, and here we can actually see the pipeline read behavior of the SPRAM, where um, while there is no right hack, the it's not it's not incrementing. We've got the first word here that's being flushed. And it stays stable until we get the right hack, and then it starts progressing. And if we look at what we wrote to memory, um, so it's this. At address zero, we wrote uh, six zero zero D B A B E, and I at word one F we wrote zero one two three four five six seven. And if we look at what's being written to the memory. The first is good babe, and then we've got the value that haven't changed, so those are the same value that were originally in memory, and then the last one is indeed um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we're actually flushing to memory um, the correct content. And then right after that, uh, we should have, uh, yeah, read strobe which indicates data coming back from memory. It's a, it's a read from memory. And then we, we load the other cache line that we wanted to um, load here. And they're the default values. They go from 410 to 41F. Um, so yeah, that, that behaves um, basically as expected. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a test bench ready for. Uh, for testing with Wishbone. Uh, 
Yeah. You, um, I, I, you know what? I can probably act one um, fairly quickly. So... Let me actually try that. So I'm just gonna um, copy that, MC core. So just quickly, just reusing the same test bench and quickly connecting the bus adapter so that we can submit at least a couple of wishbone requests and see if it behaves vaguely correctly, right? Bus adapter instance. Sorry, I'm just wiring things up. It, um, takes a bit of time, especially since the, the tablet I use for the diagram is kind of in my way when I type on the keyboard. <laughs> it's not super comfortable. So that's the bus adapter wired up. That should do the trick. The next thing we need is um, let me see. I should have a, I should have some uh, tasks already written to um, do wishbone access. I will copy that from my. Laptop. Yeah.
No, I don't necessarily recommend that um, you copy my way of doing test bench because um, I'm probably not the best one. Like the 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 way I write tasks and stuff like that, it, I'm um, really new at this. Uh, I'm more like writing since you know very little that you can synthesize. Um, no problem. I have a good. Uh, I mean, if you. I think so, a pretty good idea of what I'm doing, uh, but like um, like behavioral Verilog to simulate stimulus and stuff like that, uh, I'm very much just finding something that works and I, and I go with it, like I don't, because it's just in simulation, I don't really care too much. Um, Okay, so I th think we're good. I think I should be able to just write wishbone read. Um, wait, what do we have? What? What did I do here? Oh, I only have Bushbone. Okay, never mind. Probably only, I only have Bushbone, uh, Bushbone right task, so I'm just gonna use that. Um, and it's the address and then the data. So let's try 20h. Okay, let's try to simulate this. Um, I have a very log, so that's a good start. MC, WB, TV, LV. And then I need to list pretty much all the file I'm using. MC, oops. Simulation library uses ice cream sounds similarly. Uh, I don't think I got file here. Yeah. Mm 
Uh, I'm missing one of the files, it's on my laptop. Let me copy that. Um, okay, so... So that works, nice. Yeah, okay, so we can load the waveform. Open, uh, let's just close that, MC, MC, what, no, data, PJ, nice 40, man cache. So let's open the file we just simulated. MC wishbone test bench from PCD. Up, up, add everything, append, and see if it actually does anything somewhat valid. So, uh, let's try to find the what the good news is that the request apparently succeeded, like it gets acknowledged at some point. So that's a good start. Wait, uh, I think I didn't load the... Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, I forgot to load this uh, GTK Wave configuration that increases the font size. Just okay, that's slightly more readable. And so here we can see our request. We have um, cycle that rises um, and the request starts which means that we should have the response valid that rises at the next cycle so request valid yeah, it rises one cycle later. And I mean, here you can see that we actually knack at every cycle because like in the diagram that I said, uh, that, I, that I drew um, here, let's see if I go back to this diagram. Here I, uh, I said that uh, uh, I, drew, I drew it like the NAC comes two cycles later. In reality, it comes just one cycle later, right? I just, here I just added one cycle delay just to illustrate the fact that request valid must fall here if the request is not acknowledged directly. In practice, we only have one pipelining level between the request valid and the NAC, which means um, it's kind of like if the NAC is, is active all the time. Um, here you can see that NAC is actually high all the time because we, we constantly resubmit requests just after we've submitted it and, and it got um, NACed. And here we finally get an ACK and uh, 
and the right succeeds. Now we can try to submit another request just after that. So let's modify our test bench. Let's actually add um, a wishbone read task. Yeah. Read, so we just have the address. We don't set that. We set that to zero. We don't set that. So after this, let's say wishbone read. And let's read the same address we just wrote. And the address just after that. Okay. Obviously, I would recommend that you put a correct test bed, uh, correct make file or something, but. I have all the make files set up on my laptop, but I, here I'm just using the streaming machine to um, do the thing. It's not ideal. I need to get a better setup than this, but for now it will suffice. So I've just uh, rebuilt and um, re-simulated. Here I'm going to reload the WIF file. Um, now you see here that I actually have a dead cycle between my wishbone requests uh, because of the way I wrote the task I think I think I'm gonna suppress that so that I don't I don't actually have that cycle. So this would be this. So that I can have a wishbone request back to back which is kind of the worst case scenario right which is definitely what you want to test. Um, uh, huh? Yeah, see, that's 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 like my inability to write test bench in very log. Um, why is that falling? What is that feeling? Sorry. Um, oh, I think we need to wait at least one cycle here. Yes, that's much better. Um, so we have our first request that starts wishbone cycle here and the end here because it's it's acknowledged here, and it takes time because, well, we need to load the cache line from memory, right? Um, but then our sec our second request. only takes three cycles, which is kind of what we anticipated. When, when we talked at the, um, I think it was the first stream, when we talked about the performance impact of adding a cache, uh, because now each access t took one more cycle. Um, well, this, oh, but I'm, I'm gonna finish, like, I'm, I'm just explaining basically this last show and then I'm, I'm, I'm closing anyway, so you won't miss anything. Uh, uh, because I mean the test bench works, but that's what what I'm showing is that here we finish this access, the write succeeded. Here we we issue a read, and if we look at the um, read data signal during the acknowledge, we can see that it's wait what. Okay, I'll, I'll have to debug that because I have no idea how that can happen. But if you look, the value is caf, cafe de10. It's not. It didn't write the last byte for some reason. 
Oh, never mind. I forgot to set uh, WB mask. Okay, never mind. So um, let's fix that. Where is the default value? Have a single name. about that okay so now it worked um, the read succeed, succeeds here the write succeeds here here we get the uh, write the we read back the same address and we get the value that we just wrote and here we need we read the next address and we see that the value is correct it's what we expect to be um, pre-initialized to in the memory so on which bone with bus adapter works. I mean, it's not exhaustively tested, but come on, like, <laughs> if you look at, there's literally like five lines of Verilog, it's a very simple logic, which uh, I think we can pretty much assume that the bus adapter works. If there is an issue, it's probably in the in the cache itself. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm going to stop here. Um, what I'm going to do uh, next is probably prepare a wishbone sock with the hyperam controller um, and just have the sock boots from some embedded block ram and have the uh, cache ready to be connected and i will do the actual connection and testing on stream um, next time um, or something um, i might actually implement like the various like special commands i might uh, implement those um, just to get a, a better idea of um, the cost of them or something, but um, there is really nothing special or anything, or anything more. Um, it's going to be just this, more of the same, basically. So I'm not sure if it's really super interesting to just uh, repeat the same thing um, we did before. Uh, I might just show the result, basically. Um, and then, yeah, that'll pretty much be it. Um, I might do some more debugging and stuff like that, just some more testing. At the moment, everything I test works, um, but I want to do more testing. But it, it, I think it'd be, when first, pretty annoying just to watch me try stuff that works. Um, and also, it's actually pretty hard to debug. Like, when I debug, I like having GTK Wave with, like, a lot of traces and stuff like that, which I can't do... Um, here because my size my screen size is reduced and um, and stuff like that so um, I don't think I will do that on stream basically I'll just do the final testing and integration um, and that'll probably be the last stream about this project basically because once it's tested and it works uh, that be it is it on GitHub yet uh, no yes uh, I need I'm, okay so. Basically, my plan is, is kind of is yak shaving, right? But I've been working on a new way because at the moment I have like ice forty playground and I have one for the Akade badge and 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 one for the ECP five and that doesn't share any code, even though most of the core are actually compatible between families. And so I've been trying to reorganize the cores, like in different uh, like I have one repository per core and and using sub module and stuff like that, and it's a lot of organization work that um, is not done yet and so at the moment I have not I haven't pushed it any I, at the moment this is not this is not even in git in my laptop which is bad because it's not revision control or anything um, and so I think I will just 
give up for now and just push it to the ICE 40 playground um, repository um, along with the HyperRAM controller. Um, even though it's not ideal, um, but the organization, basically my organization in splitting things into different repositories and stuff like that is taking too much time. Um, and so I'll just push that in ICE 40 playground basically. Um, yeah, I think I'll do that. Uh, I might actually do that tonight um, or tomorrow or something. Uh, but I, I think that's it um, for tonight. Um, as usual, uh, you know, if... Yeah, yeah, sure, I, I can imagine. I, it can probably also be useful uh, for people watching the stream afterward or, you know, trying to understand some parts to just be able to have a look at it and... Uh, and see how, how things work and stuff like that, definitely. Um, so yeah, I'll get, uh, I'll get on that next. So as, yeah, as I was saying, as usual, I you can find me on IRC, on the uh, one bit squared Discord, um, um, and if you have any question or anything like that. Um, if you want to know when I stream, you can, um, follow me on Twitch and then I I usually start the stream like 15 minutes before I actually stream um, so that you should get a notification if you're a follower um, you can also follow me on Twitter I'm uh, at TNT um, it's a private account but if you request uh, I, I I accept them um, um, and yeah Oh, and uh, this is all, all the past streams are also posted on YouTube. Um, on oh, I actually don't know if I don't have. I don't think I have a channel. Maybe I should uh, do a channel name because I don't. I don't know how to find myself on YouTube. Does that work? Yeah, you can uh, search for Esmino and then you find this. And I I post this Rose uh, stream dumps, and so yeah, you can um, subscribe there as well. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you everyone for joining, and see you in the next stream where hopefully we'll actually be able to connect this to a Pico V thirty two and run it in simulation for a few instruction and and then actually try it on an icebreaker um, i'm not entirely sure yet oh i'm gonna film that because i don't have any setup to film an actual board running or anything like that so that might um, might be a little complicated i'll see how that works out thanks and bye